Welcome, 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 everybody. I'm so glad that you're all here tonight. Thank you for tuning in. So for the next 35, 45, 50 minutes, an hour, however long the doctor chooses to talk, we're going to learn about the impact of uh, not keeping your blood sugar in balance. What causes it? Uh, what you can do to help prevent it? Uh, we're not here to treat, cure, prevent anything. We're only here to discuss major health issues and what you can do to help your body naturally. God made us so incredible that if we give our bodies what it needs and treat it the way it should be treated, guess what? It will take care of itself and it will um, heal itself. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy has done this presentation once before, but what I find is when he makes a presentation and then does a follow-up, he always comes up with amazing new information. So if you were here before, uh, buckle up, get ready, because guess what? You're going to be learning more things tonight. So take it away, uh, Dr. Jeremy. What's up, guys? How are you? Let's see who all is on here. Awesome. We get lots, lots popping on. My name is Dr. Jeremy Thorpe, uh, tuning in from Missouri. Uh, I'm an internist, a chiropractic physician, clinical nutritionist. I've been in practice 23 plus years. Hey, Carrie is in the chat. Uh, Karen said, I sound, is it, I sound fuzzy, Karen, or Anna sounds fuzzy, or both of us. <laughs> um, hopefully I sound okay. And, uh, but anyway, I, I primarily work in the areas of autoimmune, uh, chronic inflammatory conditions and such. And uh, of course, diabetes, blood sugar problems is a chronic inflammatory condition. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, you know, I find a lot of people just don't understand what diabetes is and where it comes from, um, much less what to do about it if they do have blood sugar problems. Um, a lot of people just feel that it's just kind of bound to happen. You know, if, you're, if your grandparents and your parents were diabetic, then you're just going to be diabetic. Now, there can be some, some genetic tendencies if if, uh, especially with, with type one, which is actually autoimmune disease, right? Um, now that can have some genetic tendencies, but uh, type two diabetes is, is a lifestyle disease, okay? And so we're gonna talk about that. And, uh, and just uh, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, misinformation out there is once you're diabetic, you're always diabetic. And that's not true either. And we're gonna talk about um, uh, if you are diabetic, um, how you can uh, take control of your health and turn that around. So I'm going to share my screen here if I can. Um, you should see. have the rights to do that. <laughs> we'll see. Huh? There you go. All right. Am I in there? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are. All right. All right. So that's just what, oh, now my, there we go. All right, and that is what Anne already said, is that this information is not intended to replace your medical doctor's information. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, meant to uh, be uh, professional advice. Um, if, if we talk about something uh, that pertains to you, always bring that up to your doctor, okay? So uh, I always thought this was, uh, this was hilarious. Uh, this is KFC will donate a dollar to the Ju Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation uh, if you complete your meal with a mega jug, okay? Uh, <laughs> so we're going to find a cure, it says. Help us find a cure. Well, one cure would be not to ever drink a mega jug of uh, Pepsi, okay? So that's one cure. But type diabetes comes in, uh, most people believe, just two types. And when I actually teach you tonight that there's three types of diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes, most people don't realize it's an autoimmune condition, okay? This is, has nothing to do with diet, uh, lifestyle. Um, this one is, is an autoimmune, well, I'll argue lifestyle later, but this one is an autoimmune disease where the immune system actually attacks the, the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. They're called beta cells. And uh, the, the immune system attacks those cells. And of course, if those, if those insulin secreting cells get damaged, they can't produce insulin, right? And if that person cannot produce insulin, their blood sugar is soon going to uh, uh, escalate and cause trouble. So then they, uh, they call these insulin dependent di diabetics. Whereas type two, again, is a lifestyle disease uh, brought on by insulin resistance. And we're gonna talk about what insulin resistance is and what that means. Um, and this talks about usually type one is, is diagnosed uh, most often in, in youth, right? 
Um, and because there's enough damage by that time to the pancreas to start producing symptoms of diabetes. Um, now, lifestyle, uh, type 2 being a lifestyle, usually we don't see that until uh, it used to be 40s. Now, I would argue that um, because I see 20s and 30s these, these days um, getting diagnosed with type 2. Uh, and sadly, I see, um, and I saw one recently, a teenager that had prediabetes already and insulin resistance quite a bit. Uh, so starting off your, your, as a teenager, having insulin resistance and prediabetes, if that doesn't turn around quickly, um, it's going to be a sad life for that person um, filled with continued health issues, which we're going to talk about what diabetes uh, usually brings along with it. Um, so the diabetes is the, the seventh leading cause uh, of death. And um, we see uh, heart disease, cancer, accidents, lower respiratory disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes. Um, the, what I would argue is also diabetes has a, has a role in all of these other things, right? Uh, diabetes dramatically increases risk of heart disease, increases risk of cancer, increases risk of stroke, increases risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, some fast facts on diabetes, 10% uh, or 34.2 million people in the U.S., this is of 2020, um, have diabetes. So one in 10 are, are complete diabetics. Uh, one in three, 88 million, um, 18 years of older, have prediabetes. I think that's staggering. So if we were to pull the screen back up, right, and we could see all of our pictures side by side, and you look to your left, look to your right, one of you is pre-diabetic. That's just the statistics. Um, and uh, it's over 80% don't have no idea that they're pre-diabetic, um, probably because they, they don't um, get regular checkups, right? They don't go to their doctor and get some lab workups periodically to check and see how they're doing. Um, so that's diabetes and pre-diabetes. Again, di pre-diabetes, one in three, 84% do not know they have it. Uh, total costs are on 2017 estimates of uh, having diabetes in the U.S., $320 billion uh, in medical costs. 300, 237 of those are direct, 90 billion of those are from reduced productivity. So when you get diabetes, uh, it affects your health. It affects your ability to work. It affects your productivity at your job. Um, and those are costs. So when we think about diabetes, um, we also have to keep in mind the, the, the side effects and health complications that come along with diabetes. Diabetes often will cause damage to the eyes, okay? Uh, usually can, it leads to high blood pressure. This can uh, damage the high blood sugar, uh, damages the, the endothelial lining of those blood vessels in the eyes, uh, can cause retinopathy, cataract, glaucoma, um, affects the kidneys, damages those small Retinopathy. blood vessels. In the kidneys. Uh, neuropathy, we've heard of that, right? A lot of times diabetics will start to lose the feeling, uh, especially in the cheek. <laughs> um, and uh, as a result, they, they can't feel their feet. And of course, if we get an injury um, in, in our feet, uh, well, sometimes they don't even know they have an injury, which then we can get trouble. It, it reduces uh, wound healing and all of those things, which can lead to uh, amputation and, and uh, uh, even extremes like that. So brain increases risk of stroke, cerebrovascular disease, uh, TIAs, cognitive decline, and impairment, uh, Alzheimer's disease, um, heart disease, uh, high blood pressure, increases risk of coronary artery disease, and we've kind of talked about extremities already, but it does lead to peripheral vascular disease, reducing the circulation to your extremities. So not only does it reduce the circulation to your extremities, the blood supply, it also reduces the nerve supply, right? So we end up with neuropathy uh, and peripheral vascular disease. Um, so type 3 diabetes, they're now calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. Uh, and this mentions it here that the brain is on fire. So what happens, uh, and we won't go into a lot of detail, we, we, we do a whole presentation on, on neurodegenerative conditions, and um, we'll probably do that again sometime. And if you, if you have somebody in your, in your life that's dealing with Alzheimer's, I encourage you to get with somebody that invited you and get a copy of of the presentation we've done on neurodegenerative conditions because there's a lot of good research out there and ways that we can help people that have uh, that have Alzheimer's disease or type 3 diabetes. So in a nutshell, what happens is insulin resistance can happen 
in, in our body, of course, it can also happen in our brain. So our brain cells need glucose, right? Unless you're doing a ketogenic diet, the brain can use ketones, can burn fat for fuel. We'll talk a little bit of that, about that later. But uh, otherwise, it burns glucose. Well, if your brain cells become insulin resistant enough that it can't get sugar into the cells in the brain, those brain cells die. It causes widespread uh, neuroinflammation in the brain and actually causes cell death. Um, and this is one uh, cause of Alzheimer's disease. And they're now calling that type 3 diabetes. You know, a lot of people believe that uh, just because their parents and their grandparents were diabetic, that they're going to be diabetic. Uh, and that simply is not true, especially with type 2 diabetes. So I always like to use the saying, genetics can load the gun, but lifestyle always pulls the trigger. Okay. So just because you have that in your genes, just because you have that in your family history, does not mean you're destined to be diabetic. That's a lie. Uh, and, uh, and it can completely be changed. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it's the lifestyle that we're going to talk about that pulls the trigger. All right. This also talks about type two. Type two is a lifestyle disease. Food choices can either prevent or promote disease. I like this picture. This is true insulin resistance right here. So you have the insulin trying to give the cell the sugar, right? And it's saying, please take the sugar. Uh, and, the and the cell say, nope. So this is exactly what happens in insulin resistance. What happens is we, we overdrive sugar and carbs and, glu uh, um, uh, carbs and grains and starches and all of these things that convert rapidly into sugar. And that's, you know, we like those foods, right? <laughs> Especially as Americans, we like our, we like our breads and we like our potatoes and we like our sugar um, a little bit too much. So we drive the sugar and the insulin secreted by the pancreas, right? Has the key to unlock the cell to get out of the bloodstream and into the cell. And then our cell is able to create energy out of that glucose. It makes ATP. Uh, I probably remember that from biology way back when, right? Uh, creates ATP out of the glucose if that's working correctly, right? If we drive that mechanism too long, too hard, the cells stop paying attention to the insulin as readily. So the insulin is still being produced. There's no problem with the pancreas. The pancreas is cranking out insulin to beat the band. The cells just, it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. The cells are like, oh, whoopee, big deal, more insulin. Uh, and they're just not paying attention. They're just not having it, right? So the insulin becomes less efficient so the pancreas says, well, maybe I just need to yell louder, right? So the pancreas starts cranking out a little bit more insulin, a little bit more insulin. And for a while, it overcomes that resistance, right? It's able to keep the blood sugar down. It's able to drive that sugar into the cells. Um, and that works for a while. And, but we get to the point uh, that after time, the cells become so resistant to the insulin that it doesn't matter how much insulin that pancreas is cranking out. Um, the blood sugar then starts to creep up anyway. So it's not getting into the cells. So the sugar creeps up. We end up pre-diabetic. Uh, over time, we end up diabetic. Uh, and that all starts with type 2, especially um, with insulin resistance. Okay, so we, uh, we have unhealthy carbs. We release insulin. The cells become resistant to the insulin. Uh, insulin, I call it the hibernation hormone, right? It wants to grab hold of everything and just tuck it away for, for the winter. Uh, so it stores that as fat and we feel tired, uh, hangry, right? We're both hungry and angry. Uh, that's hangry, uh, lethargic. And then we just have this, uh, this cycle of insulin resistance. So I'm going to teach you just a little bit of importance uh, that I believe if you, if you don't do blood work, you need to at least get a basic blood work and see what's going on in the sugar department, because this is so preventable especially if we know this early, right? If we catch this early, the earlier we catch it, the quicker and easier this is to reverse and, um, uh, and restore normal function. So uh, this is the A1C test. You probably heard of that. The A1C test gives us an average of what the blood sugar is over about a three month period of time. So what they do is they look inside the red blood cell and they measure that glucose in there. That red blood cell lives about three months. So from that test, they can, they can determine about an average of what that blood glucose runs, okay? So in a uh, uh, normal level on an A1C is a 5.7 or below. Pre-diabetes uh, is, uh, no, sorry, normal is below 5.7. Pre-diabetes is 5.7 to 6.4 is pre-diabetes on your A1C. And then 6.5 or above is diabetes, okay? And that's about the equivalent right here of what the fasting blood sugar would be in those cases of those A1C levels, right? Pre-diabetes, 
is a fasting blood glucose of 100 to 125. Uh, normal fasting blood glucose should be lower than 99. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a glucose tolerance test because I think it's dumb. Uh, <laughs> just, be, just being truthful. Um, so if we give you just a crap ton of sugar and then we see what happens, right? It just doesn't seem like a good idea to me um, just to drive blood sugar as high as we can and then see what, uh, what your levels end up. So I don't like a glucose tolerance test. I think it's, um, uh, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, we have so much better tests we can run. So fasting insulin uh, is one of the first things, and triglycerides are one of the first things, both of those, oftentimes before you start to see changes either in the glucose or the A1C. Um, so this shows what conventional range and optimal range of fasting insulin should be. And the higher that fasting insulin climbs, Again, insulin is very inflammatory. Insulin also being the hibernation hormone uh, encourages weight gain, right? It makes it very difficult to let go of that weight, even if we do all the right things uh, and, and exercise and eat right. And uh, that high insulin just wants to grab a hold and hold on to that fat. Uh, triglycerides are often an, an indicator of blood sugar problems too. Uh, a lot of people think it has to do with fat, which is not true. It has nothing to do with fat or cholesterol in, the, in that sense of the word. Uh, elevations in triglycerides are always related to blood sugar problems. And so um, as that starts to climb, especially above 150, um, we're starting to get insulin resistance, whether we're seeing it in the blood sugar department or not. Uh, so these are the tests I'd, I'd encourage you to get done at some point. Uh, and and if, you're, if you're over 30, I would encourage you to do it annually. Um, but a fasting insulin and, and a, a lipid profile would have your triglycerides, right? And all your cholesterol and good and bad and all that. Um, your A1C, and of course, your fasting blood sugar. Those are what's most important. And guys, if you have questions, I'm going to try to go fast because we've got a lot of material to cover, and I don't want to keep you here all night. So if you have questions, just type them in the chat, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, get around to them. So um, a lot of times, again, we hear, in, especially in the medical community, we hear about diabetes as if it's a life sentence. Um, and, and honestly, there's some medical professionals that treat it as if it is a life sentence, uh, and, and they don't talk about hope. They don't talk about reversing. They don't talk about um, getting rid of your diabetes or, or that it's possible to once be diabetic and then not be diabetic um, at, at, uh, if, if treated correctly. And we can. So I don't like the term manage. That gets used a lot. I'm going to help you manage your diabetes. Well, that means I'm going to help you continue to be a diabetic <laughs> maybe not quite as bad, we're going to help you live a little bit longer and maybe slow down the progression to some of those other, un, uh, 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 some of those other uh, illnesses and things that tend to come with diabetes, but we're not gonna get rid of your diabetes, we're just going to manage it. And that's the typical medical advice. And so I see this, this is on WebMD, it drives me crazy. This is what I do half the time when I see this information because they say most adults with diabetes aim for 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal. 45 to 60 grams of carbs per meal is a lot of carbs, guys. And then 15 to 20 grams per snack. And a lot of times they're recommending at least three snacks a day, eating six times a day, um, and 45 to 60 grams of carbs on your main meals. Um, so let me tell you, if you follow this advice, you will never, and you are diabetic, you'll never, never be non-diabetic uh, because it's way too much, right? Just way too many carbs and sugars. This will definitely help you manage diabetes. It will help you keep your diabetes if you are diabetic, um, but it's not good advice to help you reverse or improve your diabetes long-term. So uh, I'm gonna talk about foods to incorporate to help your body better handle blood sugar. Um, so we're gonna talk about foods high in fiber, slow absorption of blood sugar, right? aids in detoxification, uh, things like Brussels sprouts and artichokes and nuts and avocados and nut seeds, chia flax, things like this. Foods high in chromium, broccoli, raw cheese, green beans, grass-fed beef, magnesium-rich foods. Most people, whether they know it or not, are low in magnesium. It's a test we often run uh, and probably find 80% of people are magnesium deficient, um, even more vitamin D deficient, but we're not gonna talk about that tonight. Magnesium rich foods, spinach, chard, pumpkin seeds, almonds, yogurt, black beans, uh, healthy fats are necessary. Coconut oil, avocado, olive oil, grass fed butter, clean protein, wild caught fish, grass fed beef, organic chicken, eggs, bone broth. Those are some things to incorporate in your diet 
if you want to improve your blood sugar. All right. And so this is one of the, I'm trying to move pictures here on the screen, guys. I know you can't see it, but I've got to move things around. So this is one thing that we often do with our patients um, that are already diabetic. Now, if, we're, if they're not diabetic yet, a lot of times we can get away with um, a little bit less of an aggressive approach, maybe more of a low carb style approach. But if somebody is, is full blown diabetic, we most of the time will use a keto or ketogenic diet, okay, um, which is often misunderstood. But these are some of the things, uh, uh, and a keto diet is more of a higher fat, moderate protein, very low carb type diet. And so a keto diet, instead of 60 grams of carbs per meal, you're eating under 60 grams of carbs in a whole day, probably even lower than that. But um, by getting those carbs down low enough, our body can flip a switch and actually burn its own body fat for fuel. Okay. And when we burn our own body fat for fuel, our cells, cells start to run on a fuel source called ketone bodies or ketones, which is actually a more efficient fuel than glucose is and doesn't require insulin to get inside the cell. So a keto diet um, is one of the, the keys we use to help our patients reverse their diabetes. Um, but it's not just eating a bacon burger without the bun, right? That's not a ketogenic diet. <laughs> um, it's lots of green, you know, leafy green veggies and uh, lots of healthy protein and meats. Um, uh, even using things like avocado and berries and healthy fats and nuts and seeds. Um, it, and, and that's what we would use with a well-formulated uh, keto diet. Avoiding artificial sweeteners. You know, they, we, we see all of these these sections of uh, sugar-free treats and sweets and goodies. Uh, and we assume that that's probably good for a diabetic. Um, I'd argue that probably 99% of the time you should steer clear of that aisle because they're usually using artificial sweeteners to make it taste sweet and to reduce the, the, the overall sugar content. Um, but a lot of these artificial sweeteners actually still create an insulin response uh, and still encourage blood sugar problems and actually over time increase appetite where the, the, the person that's using artificial sweeteners usually tends to, to overall eat more calories than if they weren't using those artificial sweeteners. Um, one of the things I'm going to show you here is uh, these are some, some artificial sweeteners. Um, so this one is this one is tricky. Okay, this is a Russell Stover sugar-free chocolate candy. Um, this is sorted four flavor mix of goodies, right? Sugar-free and look, this one makes it even look better. It says it's made with stevia extract. Ta-da! Stevia is like the magic word, right? That now we know this is healthy. This this must be healthy. They made it with stevia. Um, well, that's a big lie. Uh, now there is stevia in there, uh, but look at all of this stuff, right? Half of this stuff I can't even pronounce. Um, but one of the things I want to point out, and there's lots of uh, unsavory ingredients uh, in here that, that I could go on and on about. Uh, but one of the things that's tricky that they use in, uh, especially chocolates, they, they tend to hide this in chocolate sweets that are sugar-free. It's called maltitol syrup. Okay, maltitol is a sugar alcohol. What they don't tell you is, well, because it's a sugar alcohol, they, they don't have to count this in the carbs, in the total carbs on the package, okay? They don't count it at all. Maltitol syrup, for example, has a glycemic index nearly as high as table sugar, okay? So this, and then maltitol syrup, you notice is way up towards the top, which means there's quite a bit of maltitol syrup in this, in this, in this chocolate treat. And maltitol syrup, they might as well be sweetening it with table sugar because that's the effect it's going to have on your, your insulin levels and your blood sugar levels. So... Uh, there's a lot of tricky things out there that are, are uh, labeled as healthy, labeled as sugar-free, but tend to be filled with lots of other nasty ingredients. So these are some, some good choices for sweeteners. I would call these natural sweeteners. So we have allulose and monk fruit and stevia, erythritol and xylitol. These are also sugar alcohols, but they have a very low uh, uh, glycemic index. Uh, chicory root. So these are things that can be used. And, uh, and if there is a quality low carb, true uh, low carb product out there, they're going to be using these types of natural sweeteners, not those synthetic uh, fake 
sweeteners that we just saw on the other slide. Whoops. All right, so this is another important thing to reverse blood sugar problems is, is exercise, right? We hear that all the time, but I'm going to tell you why we, we hear this is exercise even just by itself improves response to insulin. So just exercise helps those cells start to pay attention to that insulin again, okay? Uh, it lowers blood glucose levels, it lowers uh, blood pressure and cholesterol levels, it controls weight, reduces risk of developing diabetic complications. So how much exercise? Uh, to decrease uh, blood glucose levels and, and causes fewer long-term complications. Uh, so for adults, it would look like 150 minutes a week of moderate uh, to vigorous intensity, somewhere in between that, uh, and two to three times a week strength training. So I see a lot of diabetics that are getting out on their treadmills uh, and they're doing their walking and they're doing things like that, and that's good. Um, but we also have to put some strength training in there too, because uh, uh, strengthening and uh, increasing lean muscle tissue uh, will even more dramatically improve insulin resistance than if we just jog or walk or get on the treadmill or get on the bike is incorporating the strength training um, will dramatically improve those results of the exercise. So nutritional supplements we're gonna talk about um, that are, are effective, curcumin, chromium, cinnamon, fish oil, which is our omega-3 fats, right? Alpha lipoic acid, uh, bitter melon extract. These are things that have really good research behind them that can improve insulin resistance, can lower uh, blood glucose levels. And one that we're gonna focus on is uh, curcumin. Do we have any questions yet, Anna? I can't see the chat when I'm in the screen. No, so far we haven't had any real questions that right. I've seen so far. All right, either I'm doing really good or they're all asleep. So I can't see everybody. No, I think they're all staying awake, they're doing great. I am gonna share one thing. You know that when you show that picture of Russell Stover's candies, yeah, that one always makes my heart so sad because my grandmother was diabetic. And every year for Christmas or for Mother's Day, we gave her lots of Russell Stover's sugar-free candies. And yeah. I think, oh my God, we were killing her. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Uh, every time I see that, my heart just kind of stops. I'm like, oh, we contributed. Uh, you know. You don't know. And and it's so tricky. The advertising, you know, is, exactly. is so tricky. Uh, and it's it's sugar free, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 bad. Um, so curcumin, uh, what we do know about the research, we're going to talk a little bit about the research, is one of the most well-studied natural supplements for improving uh, blood sugar problems. And across the board, not just lowering blood sugar, but it increases insulin sensitivity. You see right here, increases uh, uh, muscle and fat glucose uptake. So it helps those the muscle uh, uptake the sugar into the muscle cells. Um, mitochondrial biogenesis. So mitochondria are the powerhouse inside our cells that burn the sugar, right? And create the energy out of it. Uh, so mitochondrial biogenesis may, means our cells create more mitochondria, more of those powerhouses in each of our cells, re, in, in, which will, of course, burn sugar more efficiently and create more energy. Um, it decreases inflammation. Uh, all diabetics uh, and those that are insulin resistant have inflammation. It just comes with it. It comes with the extra insulin. It comes with the extra blood sugar. Um, most, um, most people with blood sugar have high levels of uh, inflammation. Uh, curcumin decreases oxidative stress. Uh, it has antioxidant abilities. It decreases lipid peroxidation. So this is what happens when we start to get damage in our arteries that leads to, to hardening and plaquing and all of those things. It improves liver uh, and kidney function, improves pancreatic beta cells. So that's the cells that produce insulin inside the pancreas. It improves the function of those cells. Uh, and those, those are all things that are done just by curcumin alone. We're going to look at just a little bit of the research. Uh, curcumin, a natural product for diabetes and its complications. Um, the anti-diabetic activity of curcumin may be due to its potent ability to suppress oxidative stress and inflammation shows a beneficial role in on the diabetes-induced endothelial dysfunction. That's the inner lining of those blood vessels that are damaged in the eyes and the kidneys and the body. Uh, and it induces a downregulation of nuclear factor kappa B, which is an inflammatory mediator that drives inflammation, downregulates that, it calms that. 
Uh, it also uh, reduces blood glucose and the levels of A1C in the blood. Uh, curcumin extract for prevention of type 2 diabetes. Uh, so what they did in this study is they took the, a group of people and they studied, well, they studied these people for nine months. One group, they didn't do anything to. The other group, they gave them curcumin. And these were all pre-diabetic people. Okay, They had that pre-diabetic range, the A1C of 5.7 to 6.4. Uh, they were all in that range. Um, some they give the, the, the curcumin to, and then the rest, they didn't give anything. Uh, of the placebo group that didn't receive the curcumin, 16.4 in nine months, 16.4%, already developed diabetes. They were pre-diabetic within nine months, 16.4% had already flipped, went over the 6.5 mark, right? And, uh, and were diabetic. Uh, guess how many in the curcumin treated group developed diabetes? None. Uh, none developed diabetes in the curcumin treated group. In addition, the curcumin treated group showed a better overall function of the beta cells, those pancreas cells. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, that is powerful. Let me show you something else that's going to blow your mind here in a second. So this is a, this was a, an animal study. Uh, cur curcumin ameliorates autoimmune diabetes. So we're, we're talking about mostly tonight, we've been talking about type 2, right, and lifestyle and too much sugar and too much insulin. Uh, type 1 is an autoimmune disease, right, where the immune system attacks the pancreas, creating uh, a lack of insulin. So this curcumin uh, treatment led to significant delays of disease onset, um, and in some, in some instances prevented the autoimmune diabetes by inhibiting the pancreatic leukocyte infiltration. What that means is it prevented the immune system from going in and attacking and destroying those beta cells in the pancreas, and it preserved its insulin expressing cells. Um, these findings reveal an effective therapeutic effect of curcumin in autoimmune diabetes by its actions on the key immune cells responsible for the beta cell death. So if we can stop that immune system from destroying the beta cells in the pancreas, right, we, have a, we might have an effect on slowing or, or preventing or even reversing some of this damage by the immune system in type 1 diabetes. Um, this, this study here talked about the nanocurcumin group. A significant decrease was found in the A1C, the fasting blood glucose, the triglycerides, and the BMI. This one was uh, talking about uh, nanocurcumin supplementation for polyneuropathy. So we talked about how diabetics often end up with neuropathy, okay? And um, they, in this study, they found that there's a significant reduction in A1C, fasting blood sugar, total score of neuropathy, total reflex score, and temperature uh, compared to the placebo. Uh, so the, the curcumin even helped these side effects that were brought on by the diabetes. Um, and this one uh, is uh, one I think is really crazy. I can't quite wrap my mind around. So they, they created type 1 diabetes in these rats. This is another animal study. Um, and so they, they caused the damage to the pancreas, to these beta cells, right? And, and they couldn't secrete the insulin. Um, so they, they, they created type 1 diabetes in these rats. Then they gave them curcumin. Um, Let's see, the, uh, they examined the diabetic rat pancreas revealed absence of islets of Langerhans. So they, they created the diabetes and they looked to see what happens and these, these insulin producing cells were gone. After five to 10 months, um, they, they, they rechecked these, these rats and the pancreas showed well-developed larger sized islets, um, which basically means that these rats that had their these cells destroyed by the immune system regrew new insulin producing cells. And, and that's not believed that it can happen. It's believed that if you have type one diabetes, these cells are destroyed, they never come back, they never produce insulin again, it's done, right? The damage is done. This is saying that in these rat studies, the curcumin treated rats regrew these insulin producing cells which is, it just blows my mind that that is even possible. So now can okay, I so ask you a question there? Is that, and that was with a, a curcumin turmeric product that was not even highly bioavailable, correct? That one was not a, it was not a nano curcumin. Some of these studies were, this one was not. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so who knows what could happen with, with, uh, better bioavailability. And so we talk about all of these amazing things with diabetics and neuropathy and type one and type two. 
Uh, we didn't get into it. We don't have time tonight, but we even see some amazing thing with type three Alzheimer's uh, with curcumin. Okay. But there's always a big, but right. We, uh, anytime we see all of these good things, there's gotta be, uh, there's gotta be a drawback somewhere. Okay. And, uh, the hidden secret about curcumin is that it doesn't absorb well in the human body. Okay. There's bioavailability issues. So this study here talks about the problem of curcumin and its bioavailability. And uh, we read further down, curcumin has been confirmed to exhibit very poor bioavailability with many studies showing very low or even undetectable concentrations in the blood and extra intestinal tissue. So there's some scientists say, you can't, you know, quit studying curcumin. We can't even get it into the bloodstream at sufficient levels to create a difference. Um, major reasons postulated are due to its poor absorption, rapid metabolism, chemical instability, and rapid systemic elimination. So. Curcumin is a, uh, is a lipid-like substance. And so we're trying to get a lipid-like substance through the digestive system, past the liver, into a bloodstream that's mostly water, right? And we know that lipids and water, and, you know, fats and oils, oils and water, I should say, don't mix well. Um, and then we're wanting to get it, you know, pass that into the cell is, is a huge struggle when uh, it's rapidly break, broken down in the liver and it's, and it's rapidly excreted out of the body. And I'm going to show you some examples of that real quick. But first, I'm going to show you the good news. Um, there is a brand new technology out that changes all of this uh, that we know about curcumin and its weak spots with bioavailability. So what they could create in the test tube, what they could create in an animal study, what they could create in a petri dish in the lab, they couldn't reproduce that in, in humans giving oral curcumin because of those things we just talked about, again, until now. So this is the patented technology that we're going to talk about called BioMS. BioMS is, uh, again, it's a German patented product. That's where it was discovered, where they take the curcumin right here. The, these red little round things are, are curcumin, and they, they uh, turn them into a nano size of less than 30 nanometers. We're going to talk about that, too. Uh, so they shrink these particle sizes to, to, to super tiny. And then they surround that curcumin particle in a micelle. Now, a micelle can carry that curcumin particle easily in the bloodstream, easily to the cells, where we couldn't get that before. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So the studies are showing up to 277 times more bioavailable than turmeric um, and just traditional curcumin. And this is the technology. First, they extract the curcumin out of the turmeric, right? Then they do they apply the nanotechnology, so they shrink the particle size less than 30 nanometers. And so a nanometer, if you, I can't even wrap my mind around how small a nanometer is. If you take your fingernail thickness and you were to slice it a million slices through that fingernail thickness, one of those slices would be a nanometer. That's how small a nanometer is. So these, these particle sizes are less than 30 nanometers. They wrap them in a micelle like the, the animation showed that can carry that easily through the bloodstream and to the cells. So how small is a nanometer? So a red blood cell is 7,000 nanometers wide. Uh, a DNA strand right here uh, is 2.5 nanometers. Uh, human hair is 50 to 100,000 nanometers thick. Uh, this is a pinhead is a million nanometers wide. And we're talking about particle sizes less than 30 nanometers in size. And this is why this completely changes the game with curcumin, uh, with the benefits of curcumin and what we can see in the human body, because we were never able to achieve levels like this in the bloodstream. We were never able to achieve levels like this in the cells, in our tissues, in our organs, in our brain that we can now. And that's why I get so excited when we talk about this technology. So this is just for an example. They give this, this patient 2,000 milligrams of curcumin, right? And then they, they, they measured the blood. And here is the peak of the curcumin levels. Ta-da! Isn't that exciting? Well, it's not very exciting. We barely got it off the baseline, right? So this is traditional curcumin. An hour, we get a peak in the curcumin levels in the, in the bloodstream. And then what happens? Well, by two hours, it's gone, OK? Uh, and that's 2,000 milligrams of curcumin in, uh, in oral dose. So this is what we mean by rapidly metabolized, rapidly excreted. 
uh, 2,000 milligrams didn't, didn't, didn't do anything in the bloodstream. Now we're comparing it to our technology here. Um, this is what's being achieved in men and women in the study using the nano curcumin, using the BioMS technology. And down here, which you can't see coming off the baseline is actually um, regular or native curcumin is down here. You can't see it rise off the baseline there because that's how low the, 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 the blood or the plasma levels are. But what's more exciting than just the peak here of what they're able to achieve in the bloodstream is look how long this is up. Remember on the other graph, two hours, it was gone, right? We're looking at four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, 20 hours, 24 hours. We still have therapeutic levels of curcumin measurable in the bloodstream after a single dose, which is unheard of. Who's talking about? <laughs> uh, Sorry. But, uh, no problem. We, we just all join in. Um, what, what I generally had to do using curcumin, and I've used curcumin and turmeric in practice for over 20 years, is we would have to dose multiple times a day. We would have to dose significant doses multiple times a day to see a change, right? If we're only going to get a little bit in the bloodstream for maybe two hours, three hours, maybe four hours at the best, um, and if we just give it once a day, we're not going to do the patient very good, right? We're not going to see a therapeutic response or a therapeutic benefit, but if we can keep it in the bloodstream after a single dose for over 24 hours, that is amazing. Not only for a, a natural supplement, but even drugs can't achieve levels in the bloodstream for this long. All right, I'm going to share just real quick a, uh, we're wrapping up things. You guys are probably thinking, man, this guy is long-winded. Um, here. <laughs> moving things around on my screen. So this patient, whoop, back up. Uh, 50, 56 uh, year old male had diabetes, hyperlipidemia, which means increased lipids, and cholesterol, and triglycerides, all that, and also had rheumatoid arthritis. This is one example of the power of this new uh, bioMS technology. So this was the fasting glucose before. Let me move again some of the things on my screen here. Uh, in November 2021, by February 2021, this was the blood glucose levels, okay? A1C was definitely in the diabetic range, 7.4, right? Anything above 6.5 is diabetic. Now we're down to a 5.6, which is technically still above optimum, but is technically not even in the pre-diabetic range anymore, which starts at a 5.7. So we went from diabetes to not even pre-diabetic anymore. Um, this was the average glucose levels here before and after, cholesterol before and after, triglycerides before and after, LDL, the bad cholesterol before and after, the HDL, the so-called good cholesterol before and after. Um, look at these inflammation levels. The C-reactive protein and the uh, ESR are very sensitive markers of inflammation in the body. Was that a 16? When we started, remember we talked about how much inflammation comes with blood sugar problems, uh, was down to a six by February. ESR, the SED rate is called sometimes, went from a 23 down to a five. Um, what's even more exciting than that, and that if that wasn't exciting enough, this patient had a positive rheumatoid factor. And what that means is the blood test that shows this patient um, has elevated antibodies, uh, which are... Uh, indicating uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so rheumatoid factor is what we would run to, to determine if a patient has rheumatoid arthritis. So above a 14 is considered positive. Okay, this was before we started, had an 18 rheumatoid factor, got come back from the lab as positive. Um, by February, this rheumatoid factor was actually negative. Uh, and I think that's one that's exciting that we were, were, were also impacting not only inflammation, we're impacting autoimmune disease. The immune system was attacking his, um, uh, his joints, um, but we, we calmed the inflammation. We also calmed the immune system on top of improving insulin sens sensitivity and lowering blood sugar. So that's just one of my patients that I wanted to share. Also, uh, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. I, I asked Rick if he's still on, if he would share um, just a little bit about his experience with the BioMS technology. Rick, are you here? Hi there, yes I am, so how are you? 
Hey, Rick, thanks for joining us, bud. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I, uh, I uh, have been uh, experimenting with stuff for many, many years. And uh, the 22nd of February, I started with the uh, Nanify. And I went into it with absolutely no expectations because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has a lot of hype and, and I just decided I wasn't going to buy into that anymore. But three days in, I noticed that uh, chronic discomfort in my right knee was, had all but disappeared. And I thought, nah, you know, that can't be true. And um, I've been popping 12, 10, 12, a leave every day for probably nine or 10 years. So that couldn't be very good for my guts or for the rest of me. But uh, since the 25th of February, I haven't had a single one. Uh, my bank account is very happy about that. And uh, so are my intestines, I'm certain. And But then I noticed, I started to notice other things like um, my hair was getting darker. Uh, I had a loose tooth way back in the back of my mouth that the gum miraculously tightened up around. And, and I thought, okay, well, you know, all of this stuff is like voodoo and, and stuff. So I don't know. But um, then uh, I noticed that if you, if you, I suffer from, I don't want to say this publicly, but I will. I suffer from anger management problems and I have, no fuse when it comes to losing my temper. And I don't know if there's any calming effect to this, but I'll tell you what, I have not had uh, an outbreak of, of a temper fit for since, well, I'm going to say the beginning of March anyways. Um, wow. Then I went to the doctor uh, on the, I went for blood tests on the 28th or 29th of, of May. Uh, my doctor phoned me later on in the afternoon and said my test results had come back and that my blood sugar had gone from, I think I sent you 10.4 down to 8.6. And that was in two months. And I've, I've, I've had a struggle because I'm not smart enough to eat properly. Um, I just, I like, you know, I walk past a chocolate bar counter and I buy a couple and down them and, and then say, oh, that wasn't very bright, but, but, I've just noticed that over the last couple of months that I am feeling so much better. I don't feel like the north end of a cow going south anymore. And, um, but here's something really interesting. The other day I was to my endocrinologist and I have no idea what that is, but I think it's a diabetic specialist. And she said to me, oh, you know, there's something really strange happening. And I thought, oh, good, here we go. More meds coming up. And she said, your thyroid was really, really acted wacky, but now it's like perfect. And she said, what have you been doing? I said, I don't know, but I pulled out the, the flyer for the Natify and I gave it to her. I said, uh, I've been taking this, it's called curcumin. And uh, what causes thyroid to go stupid? She said, well, inflammation. I said, well, look at that. Isn't that funny? That says it helps with inflammation. And she says, well, that's really, really good. So I don't know, I, like, I don't know, like, you know, like two months, three months in, and you're saying to yourself, like, what else could happen? And so I've come to this realization that if your product results speak for themselves, and they do, because I have documented proof, um, don't interrupt it and just keep doing what you're doing. And um yeah, thank you for I uh, thank you very very much for inviting me. I, I hope I didn't uh, put anybody to sleep because I do that quite often. So <laughs> that was so good, Rick. <laughs> thank you very very much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That's good. Um, yeah, hey, don't overthink it. Right, just oh. just take your drops. You'd be good to go. Um, that's awesome. Well, I, I thank you guys for hopping on. Um, I'm going to let Anna close this out. Um, let me look over here. Melissa did my little chart of good sweeteners did that answer your question about um what I, sweeteners to use i think uh, she asked that after the fact so okay. i yeah yeah so uh if, if I, I would try different stevias first of all i do believe that there are some that have 
have a bad aftertaste and there's some that don't. Um, but I would look at, um, I would look at monk fruit. I would look at uh, erythritol, um, allulose, um, things like that um, are, are great natural sweeteners that have low glycemic index. So local honey and agave, of course, uh, are much better choices than, than white table sugar, certainly, um, but still spike blood sugar and spike insulin really dramatically. Um, so a lot better ingredients if you were going to use that, right? But if you already have blood sugar problems, I would steer clear of using much honey uh, and agave until at least you get things um, a little better under control in the blood sugar. Um, awesome. So I hope you guys, if you haven't experienced this technology, I would encourage you to get back with the person who shared it with you exactly. um, as, you, as you need to. And also, um, if, if you know somebody that has blood sugar problems or is a diabetic, I encourage you to share this video with them and um, just get back with the person who invited you and they'll be able to find a copy of this. Uh, Anna will bless us with a copy of it and uh, then we can share it with those who weren't able to hop on. Yes, yes. Thank you so, so much for coming and joining us tonight. Hopefully you learned more about balancing your blood sugar, what causes it to be out of line and the power of this product. We have just seen so many lives change. So please, if you care about somebody who has uh, issues balancing the blood sugar, please share this with them and get, the, get a copy of this video and share it with them. And I do want to invite you back next week same time, same station. We're going to be back. Dr. Jeremy and myself, Anna Keck, we're going to be here and we're going to be sharing next week on uh, this is mental health month. And I don't know if you were here last week, but there was two incredible testimonies about dealing with depression and anxiety. And we're going to be dealing with kind of the same thing again, because we've just come off of two years of the most stressful years of our life. And we're probably heading into another stressful year. You know, it doesn't seem to, you think as you get older, you get better, but <laughs> not so much. <laughs> so please come back. Think of your friends that are struggling with stress and anxiety and bring them along. It's going to be the exact same Zoom uh, login, the whole thing. Just save that number and come back and see us again next week, Thursday night at 930 Eastern. 8.30 Central, 7.30 Mountain, 6.30 Pacific. We would love to have you. Dr. Jeremy always knocks it out of the ballpark, uh, just sharing his amazing medical knowledge as well as his knowledge of this incredible product that is changing so many lives. Thank you again for coming. Rick, thank you so much for sharing your testimony. That was absolutely Great. amazing. That was powerful. And I'm so excited, you know, when you see I shared with somebody who shared with somebody who shared with somebody who shared with Rick. You know, you just never know how that chain of command is going to go. So if you care about people, you share and you never know how, where that trickle effect is going to go. So keep, uh, keep reaching out and sharing. Be blessed. Have a wonderful night. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks, Anna. Bye, Thank guys. Thank you, Dr. Jeremy.